Detective Megan is back! <laughs> Hello friends. I want you to picture the scene. I'm just scrolling through my Instagram, minding my own business, when one message appears, then another, then another, and then another! <laughs> And it's all these people going, you know. Megan, you have to read Megan, this, this book. book was literally written for Have you. you seen this, Megan? Have you seen this book? So listen, I do nothing but please the people. So we're here today and we are gonna solve murder in the family together. In my four years on booktube, almost, almost got that scary. <laughs> I have never had so many people message me about a book telling me I had to read it until this one. So babes, we're gonna put our little gray cells to the test and we are gonna try and solve this book. This is a murder mystery. It is completely mixed media, the whole thing. It's about a guy who was murdered in 2003 and now a documentary is being made about the murder many years on and the truth is gonna be revealed. And apparently the book is written so that you can solve it. Now, listen, I do like to think of myself as a pretty good detective. What can I say? I'm a descendant of Sherlock Holmes, as all British people are. <laughs> I love mixed media. I love murder mysteries. I love solving stuff. So here we are. We're gonna do this together. I'm incredibly excited. <laughs> if you haven't watched one of these videos before where I solve a book, I am obviously gonna spoil this book, okay? So your options are, Go along with the ride with me, get spoiled for the book if you don't think you're gonna read it. Some of you I know have read this already in preparation for knowing I'm gonna do this video. Now, I also know that this hasn't come out in the US yet, but I'll be honest, they could not wait any longer. <laughs> they couldn't wait. The mystery was itching at my brain. What I am gonna do is there is gonna be timestamps for every check-in down below on how far into the book I am. So if you want to, as soon as this comes out, read this along with me and solve it along with me in the video. I think that could be actually really fun. I'm kind of glad it hasn't come out for some of you yet because when it does, you can solve it with me. You can like check in at the same sections with me and see if we can solve it together. Yeah, we're gonna put our little gray cells to the test and I believe that we can solve this. I believe that we can do it. So shall we get into the first check-in? One body, six experts. Can you solve the case before they do? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. <laughs> Okay, friends, who's ready to solve a murder? <laughs> I know I am. We're back at the uh, the crime board. You can see <laughs> some <laughs> some proof of last time we did this. This one was already fucked. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> so I have read the first episode of Murder in the Family. The way that this is set up in chapters is there are episodes of this documentary that is being made. We'll get into that in a second. But just for reference of how this is going to be structured, the chapters are set into episode one filming, episode one broadcast and so on and so on. So I have read all of episode one, filming and broadcast. In this murder mystery, we are solving the murder of Luke Ryder. He was murdered at his home in 2003 and that is the murder we are trying to solve, okay? I'm gonna put him in the middle of the board because we probably won't know much about him and uh, I'll be standing in front of him most of the time. <laughs> By the way, for my casting, because if you guys don't know, I always cast these books. Um, for my casting of this, I have gone with cast of Barbie, and then I've sprinkled in a few of the cast of Bottoms in there, which I haven't seen, it's not out in the UK yet, but I really wanna see it. And then when there's no actor from either of those casts that fits a character, I've gone and got a different character, hence, Noah Centino. Also, every other character in this will be the actor as they are today, because we're investigating this 20 years on from the murder, apart from, Luke because he never, that would be a skeleton. Anyways. <laughs> so at the start of the book, we meet the makers of this documentary. There is a documentary being made about Luke's murder, trying to figure out what happened. The makers of this documentary, there's like a few, but I think the only ones we need to know are Nick. He's like the producer of this and producers are always really annoying. So that's why I've got this, this Ken from Barbie, because I remember, um, is his name Simu? Yeah, the <laughs> Margot Robbie doing an interview and then being like, who is most like their character? And she said him, and he's the annoying 
<laughs> so Nick's just the producer of it. I'm not sure if he will be relevant. I'm gonna put him over here. And more importantly, we meet Gus. Hello, Logan Lemon. It's time he gets a starring role again. Gus is the stepson of Luke. So this is like a passion project. He's like, this has been ruining my family for years. I need to find out what's happened. So he's like doing this, which, okay, interesting idea. Now, then we meet some interesting characters, okay? We meet some interesting characters. We meet the experts because what they have done for this documentary is they have recruited six experts from different sides of the criminal justice system to help them figure this out, right? The documentary is them going through the evidence, them watching interviews with the family, friends, and trying to decipher what has happened. Now, you may be thinking, Megan, why are you putting them under the suspects? They are like the experts in this documentary. I don't trust them one bit. I do not trust them one bit. My spidey senses are tingling. My Sherlock senses, in fact, are tingling. I don't trust them. I think one of them, at least, is gonna have some kind of involvement in the case. So I'm including them. Some of them may have nothing to do with it and may just be there as experts. So they may be wasted space. But let's meet the six experts that we have. First, we have Alan Canning, a retired Met detective. Mitchell Clark, a journalist. Hugo Fraser, a leading UK criminal prosecutor. Layla Furness, a forensic psychologist. JJ Norton, a forensics crime scene investigator. And Bill Serafini, a retired NYPD detective. Where should we put him? Because we're gonna put the family here. <laughs> Where can we put him? What can you see? <laughs> we're running out of space already. Can you see him? You can kind of see him up there. Bill's going up there. I, he's American, so I feel like... I don't really suspect him. He can go up there, okay? So we've met our experts, right? They could be completely innocent. I don't think they are. But let's get to the heart of the mystery. Luke was killed at his family home. This is a rich ass house. Listen. <laughs> This house apparently is worth at least 20 million. It's in like this quiet suburb of London. Now, how do we come upon this house? Well, that's an interesting question. Let's meet the family. Luke was married to Caroline. Caroline was 14 years older than him and they had only been married for about a year. There was accusations that like, he was a gold digger, she was a gold digger, what's going on in their relationship? But yeah, she was 14 years older than him and she had inherited the house from her dead ex-husband. Now, when Caroline met her husband, she was actually working as their au pair, as the nanny. <laughs> for her husband's son. Her husband's wife, at the time, dies in a car crash. <laughs> so, who knows, there may already be something about like getting rid of, <laughs> of spouses going on. I do just wanna say, the age gap looks bigger than it actually was because I've put Lisa Kudrow as how old Caroline is in the present day and Noah Centino as how old Luke was 20 years ago. So just imagine Lisa Kudrow 20 years ago as the age gap here, okay? <laughs> so anyways, yeah, his wife dies under suspicious circumstances. They get engaged within weeks of her death and they go on to have three children together. Maura Howard, Emily Howard. You don't need to know much about their childhood. There was a lot of parties going on with like their dad's business contacts, but their dad dies of a heart attack. I think when he's out with Gus, like or golfing one day. So it doesn't seem like there's foul play involved in that, but obviously Caroline inherits a lot of money and this old ass, rich ass house. How does she come to meet Luke? I wonder. And how does he end up dead in the house like a couple years later? So remember I said Caroline was a nanny. Well, she was nanny to her husband's first son, Rupert Howard, okay? Now Gus talks about how he didn't really know him that well. They only remember meeting him like at the funeral. He travels to Australia and it is where he meets Luke. Now see, Luke grew up mostly in Australia. He did, his parents did come from the UK. I'm not sure if he was born in the UK, but he did grow up in Australia and they meet there. His parents have both died. His mother died when he was only six and his dad more recently. So he's used the money to travel to Sydney. He's surfing the waves. He's living like, you know, just like a free life. He's on the beach, you know, drinking by the beach. You know, that's the kind of life he's living. And they have a summer of being busy mates. Now, I have some red string, as any good crime scene investigator does. Now, for me, that is an immediate connection. I feel like this could be a little bit suspicious because obviously one day when Luke comes to England and Rupert meets up with him, 
Caroline and Luke hit it off and he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Why is my friend marrying my stepmom? So there could be some sort of unresolved feelings there. I don't know. But I'm immediately a little bit suspicious of Rupert. He doesn't seem like a nice guy either. He's like a little bit of a dick. <laughs> so I'm immediately a little bit suspicious of him. Obviously they marry and then a couple years later he is dead. Now the way that Luke is killed is he is bludgeoned in the face. There is a uh, head trauma at the back of the head but that could be from him you know falling when he hits his head when he's like dying or something but the main cause of death is his face has been bludgeoned to the point of like unrecognizability now something we find out right now is the timeline this is important as you can see from the timeline caroline drops the girls off at a cinema she leaves to a party so the only people home are luke and gus it starts to rain at about 10 20 and maura is the one to find the body now that also makes me a little bit suspicious immediately because could she have done something? She's about 15 at this time. Could she have killed him in a fit of rage, not liking him as her stepdad? I don't know. So that's just an immediate link. Now, something that is important to note is that the grass underneath Luke's body is dry. So that means he was killed before it started raining at 10.20. That's the most important thing we know from that timeline. So the experts are talking about this once we kind of find out the key information about the timeline. They say we need someone that has won the means. The police never conclusively identify a murder weapon. Now obviously it's something heavy that someone has used to bludgeon his face. It could be a hammer, it could be a rock. There was like work being done on the property. There's a lot of loose stones and there's a pond not far from where he's found in the garden so someone could have used a rock tossed it in there the pond was eventually like drained but by then it's been in water it would be difficult to tell if there had been blood on a rock so we need someone with the means with the opportunity now the gate was locked the front door was locked so they suspect it is someone who either knew luke and he let them into the house or it was someone who lived at the house and we need someone with a motive do we really have anyone with a motive yet not really i don't think we do but the experts do happen upon one key piece of information. They look at the timeline of that morning. There are large chunks when Luke is alone at the house, when Caroline goes out to drop the kids off to school, goes out for lunch. And at 2.30, just before Caroline comes home at 2.45, there is a two minute and 33 second phone call from a phone box outside King's Cross Station. As, they, as the experts point out, that is too long a phone call for a wrong number. And Luke never mentions this phone call to anybody. So could that be the person that he then let into the house who then killed him? I feel like the phone call is the strongest piece of evidence we have so far because it shows he communicated with someone who then he didn't tell anyone about that and it's just a missing piece of the puzzle. I don't think we have many missing pieces of the puzzle. Everything so far is pretty much laid out. Caroline at the time of the death was at a party about 20 minutes walk away. The experts discuss this, say could she have left? Yes she could have done without someone necessarily noticing but by the time she then returned to the party she would have been soaking wet because it would have started raining and she would have been covered in blood. I guess the easy assumption is her. A lot of the press at the time were like oh my god it's her she killed him she's the wife it's always the wife or the husband do you know what i mean but the experts point out only two people really so far seem like they could have a motive that is caroline and rupert rupert says he wasn't actually in london at the time of the murder but again you'd have to check that so they're saying you know there are only two suspects there are only two suspects then mitchell says apart from me what a cliffhanger to leave an episode on. <laughs> Turns out Mitchell was the first journalist on the scene and he got there even before the police, which is, which is just suspect. There's something not not right going on. And why is he saying that he should be a suspect? What What's going on? So, so far, in terms of who I'm suspecting, I mean, I feel like we haven't had a ton of information to suspect people. We've kind of just learned the facts of the murder, what timeline is so that we can use this kind of stuff to then perhaps piece things together later on. Emily has been very quiet so far. Maura did interviews with a documentary. Gus is obviously running it. Caroline, if I should mention, has been diagnosed with early onset dementia. She's only 60, but she isn't quite aware of what's going on. And Rupert has done interviews, but Emily hasn't. And Maura has been texting her saying, is everything okay Like with you? There seems to be something going on in her life that will mean she's not okay. And we haven't really heard much about her. And that makes me instinctively suspicious. <laughs> but other than that, I don't really have any any theories 
so far. I know Sherlock probably would, but I don't. So I'm gonna go ahead and read some more because I feel like we've got the key facts of the case now and now becomes me actually theorizing. So I'm gonna go read the next section and then I'll come back to you once I have some theories. Oh, how the plot thickens. <laughs> so we have just read episodes two and three of the book and a lot has happened. I'm gonna try and distill it down for you in like the simplest way possible. Mitchell, <laughs> this dude over here, was taken in for questioning on the night of the murder. He's a journalist, he's sitting in the car listening to police radio, he hears a call in for the house. He's like, that's a nice ass house. What the fuck is going on there? He drives up, he trespasses, he finds the body. He says he's standing over the body, sees police coming, he runs, they arrest him, take him, take him in. He says, they're accusing me of being a drug dealer. I had a bit of weed in my car. I didn't have anything on me. They had nothing on me, they released me, whatever. Then, I can't remember who it is. I think it's Bill and Alan, because they're the police girlies. They go <laughs> to the ex-lead detective on the case, and he's like, that's not quite the story. I mean, this is police, so can we trust him? I'm not necessarily, you know, whatever. But what he says is that we knew he was some sort of a low-level drug dealer, as well as being a journalist. All of his journalism stories, or a lot of them, are to do with crime and gangs, and he has a lot of inside information on this. Now this could just be because he is a young black man from poor areas in London and so people feel like, people in those situations feel like they can trust him and speak to him other than like a white upper middle class journalist but whatever. <laughs> but they do say that although no drugs were found on him he did have 300 pounds in his pockets and 50 pound notes which if you're not from the UK we don't really ever have 50 pound notes. You usually just have 10 and 20 pound notes. So that is a little bit suspicious that he had that kind of money because like if you put in I don't know into an ATM or I need 300 pounds it may give it to you in like 650s. Do you know what I mean? So that is a little bit suspicious. The policeman also said that he wasn't standing over the body. He was like hiding in one of the bushes and someone found him. So Mitchell's a little bit suspicious, even though he is one of the experts. He's already got a red line going. Then, right, we were trying to figure out what could Caroline's angle be, right? And Maura comes out saying, yeah, me and um, Emily thought she might be having an affair. One day, Emily came home to sex noises <laughs> upstairs. Her mum comes down the stairs, kind of ruffled. Luke was away at the time, he wasn't home, and there was this red sports car on the driveway with like sneakers and like sweatpants in the car. So, hmm. So that's a little bit suspicious as well. Was she having an affair? Did the other man get jealous and kill Luke? Did they arrange to meet at the house thinking that he wouldn't be there and then the other man comes upon him and kills him? Did she kill him so that she could move on with her other affair? So I said that she was 20 minutes away at this party. Obviously they speak to people at the party. You can't know, there's so many people there. You can't know if she disappeared for a moment. But she was there until like 11.30 at night. And the woman who ran the party did say that her heels were dirty but she could have just been going to smoke a cigarette out in the grassy area. So that's not necessarily a lead. Luke was also supposed to be at that party, by the way. So the idea that like the guy she was having an affair with could have been there, which apparently people did see a similar car outside. I don't know, I found that kind of surprising that like she, I don't know, would have been going to that party knowing the guy she was having an affair with would be there with her husband. I don't know. We've got another suspicious thing about fucking Rupert over here. They speak to someone who he was at school with at Cambridge because they're like, could he have been in London? Does he have an alibi? Turns out he was at a dinner in Cambridge. He didn't leave that dinner with enough time to go to London and come back. It's like two hours each way at least. But he did disappear from the table for about 30 minutes. And when he came back, this is about 8.30. So if you recall, Caroline has just dropped the girls off at the cinema. It doesn't start raining until 10.20. I think the estimated time of death is somewhere between like, 9.20 and 10.30 is the estimated time of death. He gets a phone call at 8.30 and he comes back saying it was an emergency at the house. 
So could he have been organizing a killing of Luke for some reason? But he doesn't seem to financially benefit from it at all. Could it just be jealousy that his friend is now with his stepmom who he hates? They also talk a bit about how Caroline's ex-husband's ex-wife, <laughs> she's had alcohol in her system at the time that the car crash happened that she died in. The roads were icy, but apparently she wasn't a drinker. There's definitely some suspicious stuff going on with that one. There is a text message exchange between Emily and Maura, where Maura's like, I told them about the thing that you saw with mum. And Emily's like, why would you do that? And Maura says, you know, mum's not gonna see this anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And it helps them, you know, ignore us. It means they don't focus on us. And Emily's like, yeah, okay. And Maura's like, big sisters forever. You know, sisters forever, love ya. I'm like, I'm really suspicious of them. I know they were like 15 and 13, but like, could Luke have been a dick to them or something? I don't know. If that happens, I support women's wrongs. <laughs> just gonna say that now. If he was a not a nice man to them, I support it. But I'm just suspicious. There's something suspicious going on here for me. And then, this is where it gets juicy, girlies. This is where it gets juicy. Turns out, Mr. Luke over here, okay? So I got my, I got my timeline a little bit mixed up. They met in Greece when he was living in Greece, right? So originally he's in a small town, Australia. Then he moves to Sydney. He leaves Sydney in a rush. He hands his notice in five days after a car crash happens, which is exactly between where he lives and his workplace in the middle of the night. Someone drives into someone and doesn't stay at the scene. Then Mr. Bill over here, NYPD fire detective, <laughs> finds out that in between moving from Sydney to Greece, he lived in Beirut and there was a bus bomb there that leaves, left 13 dead and a lot of people injured. And at first he's saying, oh yeah, he was injured. Turns out, Luke Ryder died. Luke Ryder died. Luke Ryder died. So the Luke Ryder from Sydney that we know about his upbringing, his mother dying young, and the one who has married Caroline, who has been murdered, who has friends with Rupert, is not the same Luke. It's a different Luke. Whoever this Luke is, stole someone's identity. That was kind of a gag of the century. That was kind of a gag of the century, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> now, here is the problem I have with this. That's basically what we know so far. Here is the problem that I have with this. From this, you'd think, okay, it's something from his past that he's running from. Someone's gonna come get him. If this is a fair play murder mystery, like it espouses to be, right? It says, you can solve me, whatever. We're about 40% into this book. We should have met the suspect by now. If it is someone not on this board, it is outrageous. <laughs> It has to be someone from this board. So if it is someone from his past, it would have to be one of the experts who knew him, like Alan or Bill or whatever, who knew him in the past, but we just don't know that about them yet. If it is someone on this board, I'm gonna be furious because that is not a fair play murder mystery. We should have met whoever it is. If Caroline is having an affair with this red car guy and that somehow factors into it, it should be someone on this side of the board here, okay? But I am suspicious of these two. So my current suspicions are either this guy was a dick, especially if it's someone who's stolen a dead guy's identity, right? He was horrible to them in some way and they're like, let's kill him. <laughs> let's kill him. Or it's something to do with the affair Caroline is having and it's one of the guys over here. One of the guys over here who kills him because of the affair. That's kind of what I'm thinking at the moment. But who was the call with Rupert with? Is that a red herring? Is that a red herring? Or could that all be linked somehow? Hmm, interesting. Oh wait, I missed a page by accident. Okay, right, so it's just saying that the girls didn't know about Luke not being who he said he was, but did mum know? And if not, it could explain a lot of things. Okay, people are also wondering how Bill has got all this information about Luke so quickly. Is there something he's not telling us? Oh, interesting, okay. Time to go read the next section and we'll see where we are on that. That's my two, that's my kind of work, main working theories at the moment, but yeah. If it's not someone on this board, I'm gonna be pissed. I don't wanna meet anyone in the next section because 40% into a fair play murder mystery, you should have met whoever it ends up being. Hello, hello, hello. Time for our next check in. This one will be a bit of a quicker one because it was more going through information we already had rather than getting new information. I haven't got anything new to add to the evidence bored yet. Let's go into it. So we first find out that the imposter that is imposterating, <laughs> impostering, no, impersonating, 
<laughs> Luke is an American who was in the same bomb crash that he was in. Um, and in that chaos, he was like, yeah, let me steal this guy's passport. Presumably the passport was in pieces so that he only had to send it off to the Australian embassy with a picture of himself. Like, can you make me a new one, babe? So that's the, that's the situation there. We learned from another friend of Caroline that Emily, Maura and Gus actually hated Luke. They hated him, babes. <laughs> they hated him. Gus like ruined the wedding cake on the morning <laughs> of the wedding. Emily particularly hated him and Maura started acting out that summer, hanging out with people that she shouldn't be, doing drugs. She was 15 at the time. So like even though Gus is like spearheading this, he's like hated him. No. No. <laughs> That friend also confirms the affair that Caroline was having. She said he was, she was definitely having an affair and he was bad news. Apparently it was like instant attraction, overwhelming chemistry. But like Caroline kind of knew his bad vibes. When she was younger, she got like shipped away because she was in a relationship that her parents didn't like. So it's kind of similar guy, similar vibes. And apparently she was just about to end it before Luke. <laughs> they also speak to the real Luke's grandma who's living in a care home in the UK at a time and the imposter Luke visited her a lot and was trying to get her money and they're like kind of looking into whether the people who then got her money when once he died could they have done anything essentially is the situation but then we find out this is the real not much happens in this chapter in my opinion then we find out he is a serial imposter because someone goes to birmingham in america I don't know are there a lot of birmingham's is alabama i think birmingham alabama i think it's bill goes there to um speak to people around and it turns out that the real eric who is the guy they think is impersonating luke was this small shy gay boy who moved to New York in the 90s to get away from this small town. And they're like, this, you know, this Luke was tall. He was into women, <laughs> apparently. So it becomes clear that it's a serial imposter. Serial imposter, which, you know, seems like he's a con man. Maybe a con man who's preying on women. When they say that, it immediately goes to my mind he's not playing on Caroline. I still think there's something here. Now, if it does become something like he abused them in some way, I don't usually like that being a twist. So I'm not sure if I'd feel comfortable with if that were to happen. A curveball that I will have, I have a theory, there's something scratching at my brain, my Sherlock Holmes senses. I don't trust Alan the Met detective guy. He's been the one investigating the cars, right? He like whittled down through lots of search criteria to basically just finding the men in the area who owned this specific make of car at that time. He's trying to contact them all. It seems a bit like a wild goose chase and it's taking up all of his time. I think he's taken that on because he was the one having the affair with Caroline. That's my theory. I don't know if he's killed Luke, but I think that's gonna be a twist. That's my twist. I think he's taken on that, 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 that <laughs> role. Cause they kind of a volunteer like, oh, I'll, I'll look into that, I'll look into that. I think he's taken on that role so that he looks into it so that none of them notice him come up in the search criteria cause he's the one looking into it. And it like takes a long time. So he's able to figure out how to throw him off his scent of XYZ. I think it's him. Listen. I'm putting that in now. I'm putting that in now. So that's all the information we read. And we're only gonna have one more section that we're gonna read before we have to make our final prediction. So I'm really a bit nervous about that. <laughs> I'm gonna take a break. This is gonna be my last check-in for today. And then I'm gonna start reading again tomorrow and with the hopefully fresh eyes, morning eyes, you know what I mean? I'll be bright, awake, nice and early, you know, it'll be the vibe. But like, I think it is. There's still these texts between Maura and Emily. Also, there's like someone saying on like, gossip forums online that she was in rehab for like opioids and stuff 10 years after. That could be, again, that could be like if she went through something traumatic, did she use them to like cover the pain? I don't know if I'd like that if there was a twist. But also at the end of the chapter, there was lots of weird stuff going on with like all of these experts like little little things going on that make you think you could suspect any of them that hope maybe some of them are closer to the case 
because that crash that I mentioned, they found out that was a Muslim local student who died and his parents were trying to keep his name out of the press because he'd likely been drinking at the time. But then they find out that Layla's maiden name was actually Khan, the same as the student. And one of them says, oh, I guess that's just a coincidence in it. And she says, yeah, like, it's just as common as the last name Smith. But then straight after that, she's like contacting her mum, like, can we talk? Could be a coincidence, could be a red herring, or it could be true. There's loads of those like red herrings with these experts at the end of the chapter. I don't know. And this fucking Nick guy, I haven't heard anything about but I don't trust him. I don't trust him. I don't trust you. He's barely been in it but I don't trust him. So at the moment I think the girlies could have something to do with it and I don't trust Alan. I don't trust Alan. Anyways that's my current theory. When I see you next, <laughs> when I see you next I'll have to make my final theory um, which I'm a little bit nervous about because I don't know Oh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm about to solve this. See you in the morning. <laughs>five and six let's talk through what's happened a lot of the start of episode five is just them going through previous lines of inquiry to do with particularly luke's identity and stuff like that then it is revealed from a video from caroline and andrew's honeymoon that caroline actually has a cesarean scar which means she had a baby before gus maura and emily i don't i don't know if it's gonna end up being anything it feels more just like a grief like a an allergy for how true crime often just sees women's bodies as collateral kind of thing you know what I mean but that would mean that the child when Luke dies would be I think about 23 something around that age so maybe they've just found out who Caroline is they're angry about this lavish life that the rest of the family are living in this house maybe they grew up more impoverished and they come back and they're angry maybe I don't know I don't know about that one chief I don't know I don't know I don't think that will end up being related but you know I could be wrong <laughs> then it becomes clear do you remember I wrote for Bill how is he getting information we find out he actually has been working on a version of this case for 25 years not focused necessarily on Luke's murder but focusing on him as a con man throughout history particularly when he was a con man in New York he's known about this and he kept information from the rest of them like that's how he was finding out information he was kind of just drip feeding what he knew and Nick knew that he knew Nick's a slimy asshole by the way when he didn't pre-warn Gus that he was gonna find out he had another sibling he's just all about ratings slimy slimy <laughs> So they work out, particularly JJ, where's JJ over here? Sorry, Michael Sarah, you haven't had a big role in this. They work out that he's actually from Canada. Luke originally is from Canada through the picture that he had in his wallet, right? He has a picture of a child and a mother in his wallet and they use a water tower in the background to locate where it is. And he's actually from Canada. Let me just add a line for Bill because he was super shady. And also um, Alan asks him like, oh, hang on, I need my scissors. <laughs> Alan asks him if he has an alibi for the night that Luke was murdered. He says, I wasn't in the UK. And then Alan looks it up and finds out he was scheduled to be at this crime conference in the UK from the 1st to the 4th of October. The murder takes place on the night of the 3rd. Then Bill's like, oh, I couldn't make it. And then someone in one of the chat functions says that their mother was at the crime convention and she recognized Bill from a photo. So he's a liar, he's a liar. They actually, they get a picture of this child from Canada. He was called Jonah and they do facial recognition for him aged up and he looks exactly like Luke. So that's who this guy is. He's a serial con man. He first faked his death when he was 17. That's the sitch, okay? We think that's it, right? Remember Luke was in Greece, right? Originally, that's where him and Rupert met. There were pictures of him with a woman then Bill tracks that woman, figures out who that woman is. They had some people saying her name was Irene, some people saying her name was Carrie, and he figures out that Alan has a sister called Eileen Canning, who was declared bankrupt two years after Luke would have met her in Greece. So it looks like, and Alan pretty much confirmed, that his sister was scammed 
by Luke and thus he had reason to hate him and want him dead. Dear God. Okay. So here's the thing. If you remember, I was suspecting Alan for a long time because he was the one looking into the cars and it just for some reason felt like he was going to be the one with the car and he's like stalling for time. He kept saying kind of weird stuff that made me suspect him. I feel like we still have a hundred pages left of the book, right? But I feel like the reveal is going to happen within the next maybe 50 pages. I feel like... <laughs> I feel like it's too early for that to have been revealed if it is him. That makes me not think it's him anymore. We have to make up our theory now. We have to decide what happened. Perhaps the baby could come into it somehow, but I don't think the baby, Caroline's baby that she had before the rest of the kids, could come into it somehow, but I don't think they're gonna be the murderer, right? I am still leaning towards the sisters. The fact that we have the text messages from them, which are a small part of the book, they're like one page in each chapter, but there's just something about them and the way they speak that makes me think there's some level of guilt there. But it's like an angry crime, right? Whoever killed Luke was angry at him. They like pummeled his face in. I still think the phone call is our biggest clue, the one that happens at half two from a phone box at King's Cross. I, feel, I still think that's our biggest clue. I mean, the girls went to school on foot, so they could have just not gone to school. They returned from school at 4.15. They could have just not gone to school and been somewhere else. But I don't know if there's necessarily been a lot of evidence towards them. That's just what my gut is saying. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like a lot of the stuff about Luke's identity has been red a red herring for the actual murder. I don't know. I just don't see it lining up. But then what what resolution could happen with these two that makes me think that's a satisfying ending based on the evidence we have so far. You know, when the whole information we have about the red car is from a story that Emily told saying, oh, I think my mum was having an affair. Someone, I remember, I think it was Layla was like, she had no reason to make that up about her own mother, so it must be true. Well, if she killed Luke somehow, she could have thought, as a child, she would have been like 13 and 15. They could have thought like, oh, if we like, intimate there's like a big scary man who would have been angry with Luke they'll think it's him but then there was that friend who like semi confirmed the affair but the stuff that Caroline told her that the friend thought confirmed the affair could be twisted and actually mean something else in reality oh guys I don't know okay I'm gonna go mm. But I'm very suspicious also of like these three experts, Hugo, JJ and Layla, because like nothing has happened with them yet. Whereas I feel like Bill and Alan have had, and Mitchell have had like big storylines, whereas these have had no real links to the story. And I feel like that could happen in this last section. But then how would that be satisfying? Oh God. <laughs> I'm going to go with the sisters or Alan. I have been suspicious of Alan the whole time and the fact that we are near the end now and there's that stuff going on with his sister. I'm gonna say Alan or the sisters did it. They killed Luke. That's my guess. <laughs> but I do not feel comfortable in this guess at all. I don't think I'm right. <laughs> I don't know if I feel like this has been a completely fair murder mystery. I don't know. But then we can't forget Mitchell being found actually at the scene with that money, with the 300 pounds and 50 notes. Could he have actually just done the murder? It's been like a double bluff the whole time. I don't know. God, I'm not good at this. Okay, that's my final answer. The girls or Alan, but I recognize I could be very wrong. <laughs> okay, let's go finish it. Let's go finish the book and I'll come back to you and we'll see how right I was. I bet you there's a key piece of evidence I haven't even fucking told you about that ends up being key, or there's a whole other character who's not on here who ends up being, I'll be fuming. If that's the case, it's not fair play. It's not fair play. All right, I'll see you in a bit once I finish it. <laughs> okay, I'm filming this on my phone because I'm just making lunch, but I just realized I had another thought that I never spoke to you about because it's kind of the obvious thing. Luke could have faked his death especially now that we know he's like faked his death or like taken advantage of stealing other people's identities. Could he have faked his death and move on? Because the whole idea of the way he was identified was the jacket um, and his fate. I'm... F Go away. <laughs> 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 
No! No! What was I saying? Yeah. Um, his face was so bashed in that he was, like, unidentifiable. But that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Like, that's your first thought. Oh, it's not him. It's someone else. But that's kind of obvious. And we found that out at the start. So if that is it, is that satisfying? Could one of the girls actually have, like, helped him fake his death? Like, Mora or something? I don't know. But I just wanted to say it because I realised I'd never said it. I just wanted to say it. So if it does turn out to be that, let me pick up all these fucking nerve bullets. If it does turn out to be that, then I've said it. But I think that's pretty obvious. So we shall see. rundown because all the experts who weren't connected already ended up being connected as I fucking said they would. I just, I read so many of these. So Layla's brother was the one that they thought was in, in the hit and run that made Luke leave Australia. But turns out someone else confessed that on their deathbed so she doesn't think it was him. JJ was a baby who was adopted in Birmingham at the same time that Caroline had the baby. So like it could be JJ but it's never conclusive whether he's a baby or not. And Hugo was the one that Caroline was fucking. Oh my god, Caroline. And it was his red car. But listen, none of them are the murderers because, 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 because at first Maura comes in she comes in and she's like, yeah, okay. Like they all accuse her and then she tells them the truth. And she's like, I got home. And um, Emily, um, I couldn't even say her name. Emily was <laughs> putting bloody clothes in the dryer. So I had to help her. I go out there, I find he's dead. I'm gonna help her, I'm gonna protect her. So she gets arrested. I'm out here thinking, <sighs> I'm a genius. I'm a fucking genius. Like I'm, I've done it. I've only gone and done it. I've only gone and done it. But then, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. Turns out, <laughs> it was Gus as a 10 year old child because he was like fucking going through trauma of his dad dying in front of him and this mirrored it. And so he killed him in like a fugue state and he doesn't remember it. Same way he doesn't remember his dad dying. Same way he doesn't remember his kicking over the cake and destroying it. It was him. It was Gus. Can I just clarify, those of you then who have read it, right? At the end then, Gus dies from an overdose and then his watch is found in the town from Australia where he's from. Am I right in thinking that Luke's sister kills Gus and steals his watch and makes it look like an overdose in revenge? I don't think that's fair. He was a 10 year old child. Who is his sister? Because that's not fair. You're killing someone over something he did as a 10 year old child with like severe mental issues and trauma. Get a grip, Rebecca. Was her name Rebecca? I feel like it was. Get a grip. Get a grip. Yeah, turns out I didn't solve it. I really thought I did. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> Best detective in town. <laughs> Turns out I was wrong. <sighs> I thought I solved it. Is that a satisfying ending? I mean, I literally, I didn't write anything for him. I didn't write anything for Gus. And yet he is at the center of all of it. Oh my hat. I didn't write anything. I never suspected him. I don't know if it's just the trope of like, he couldn't remember anything. I was so close. I was so close. Fucking Gus. It was fucking Gus. Logan Lerman as a murderer. I would pay to see it. I think this has been like option to be adapted. So just take a look at my casting, please. Whoever makes this. Netflix, Amazon, BBC. Whoever makes this. Just take a look at my casting. Take it in. Because I think this could be a good cast, you know? Oh, I didn't even tell you. Turns out also Mitchell was sleeping with Maura. He was 21, she was 15. Dear God. Okay. So there was that. <laughs> Whatever. So yeah, I failed. I didn't solve murder in the family. Did you guys solve it? Did you guys figure out that it was gonna be Gus? 
because I didn't. In terms of rating, I would give this a four. It wasn't quite a five, but I do think it was well done. I would give it a four. I do think though with these kind of videos when I do these, like it's a very different reading experience. I almost don't know how to rate the books because I'm not really focusing on my enjoyment of the book. I'm so focused on whether I can solve it. Like I'm actually exhausted, guys. <laughs> Usually reading a book like this or filming a video wouldn't leave me exhausted. This is like so much, I put a lot of mental energy in this. It might not look like it, but I did. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. <laughs> Let me know if you figured it out. Let me know if you've read this, if you haven't. I hope you enjoyed the video all the same. Um, and Detective Megan will be back at Christmas. I will be trying to, you know, re-earn my title. Anyways guys, I'll see you soon in another video. Bye. <laughs>